on, <laughs> not a moment too soon, <laughs> with Cliff Blydner, uh, the scientific poet, uh, one of our key people on Long Island. And Cliff is a uh, really a scientist. He's a uh, pharmaceutical uh, chemist, if that's the right phrase. Right. For that. yeah. That's that sort of thing. Um, uh, it is not true that he created Valium. No, but, uh, don't blame that on me. But uh, he came up. He came up with uh, with a few th other things that were interesting. I understand that the uh, one company uh, did a small modification on the formula and now is using it to patch tires. Oh, good. Well, it's a, I'm glad there's some use for it. You never, you never know. I forget what it's called, but uh, you never, you never know what science will bring to you. Anyway, uh, we move from uh, better living through chemistry to better living through poetry. And uh, Cliff is going to share some of his scientific spiritualism with us, um, including his haiku. Cliff is a haiku master, and he will be uh, demonstrating that a little later in the program. So, Cliff, welcome to oh. Poet the Poet, and uh, why don't you just start off a little, a little goody there? Okay, I'll start. A, uh, I'll start off with something scientific, uh, so you'll okay. understand what you were talking about. This is called "Not So Good Vibration." Somewhere, somehow, some way, there was that first resentment. A huge gauntlet thrown down, a big bang whose echo I am forced to listen to. True, true, by every law of science, true. But I am accountable for all I do. And another one, basically along that same line about uh, evolution. This is called Two Bees. Behind every human, an ape and a rat. Before every human, the power of choice. I hope everybody wrote that one down. <laughs> believe it, that is an important poem, believe it or not. Even though it's short, it really gets uh, the point across very quickly. Okay, um, thanks. And one more about evolution. Uh -huh. Not going anywhere. Oh. But 400 million years of evolution. 400 million years of evolution, and they are still roaches. <laughs> After an afternoon with my nephews, I might suggest a revision. 400 million years of peanut butter and jelly, and the kids still want the crust cut off. After 400 million years. Okay. All uh, right. How about sharing a little haiku? Okay. I, I'll explain my what haiku means to me In after reading a few. In 17 or less, right? right? Yeah. I, <clears throat> well, first I'll do a few. On dead leaves, a buck skull sprouting violets. On dead leaves, a buck skull sprouting violets. Throughout the long moonless night, drop after drop, one drop dropping. Throughout the long moonless night, drop after drop, one drop dropping. And since I could not have the voluptuous fruit lady, I bought two mangoes. Later, we'd like another... Oh, sorry, Since I could not have the voluptuous fruit lady, I bought two mangoes. I always get so excited when I hear that one. Uh, waiter, we'd like another <laughs> order of mangoes, please. Um, Victoria, are you, are you ready to rush out now and write haiku? <laughs> no, haiku is not my style. I'll leave that to Cliff. Ah, perhaps if Cliff gives a little of his haiku philosophy, we might be able to change your mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. The way I see haiku is, if you remember, some... Some people my age will remember Zorro, the way he used to cut that Z. Zero? Like one, two, three. And uh, three bold strokes, that's what haiku is. Ah. It's uh, the rising sun, this, uh, the rising moon, the setting sun, the two of us. The rising moon, the setting sun, the two of us. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not uh, 17 syllables. That's a language difference between Japanese and English, which does, really does not apply, but we call it all haiku. That some of it's rhymed, and some of it's titled, and some of it is 17 syllables, and some of it is even one word. But we just call it all haiku because we'll just be arguing forever, and we're here to talk about art. It's also kind of a catchy yeah. name, uh, haiku, when you think about it. Right. Um, do you ever write any Senryu? Senryu, yes. Okay. I have this one called, uh, the South, it's titled The South Bronx. Sanrio. Ah. And uh, the most famous haiku is Basho, at the old pond, a frog leaps the sound of water. 
So this is a uh, this is a South Bronx Sanrio. At the old pond, a frog leaps, caught in the crossfire. At Ouch. the old <laughs> at the old pond, a frog leaps, caught in the crossfire. Um, I can understand the crossfire, but how does a frog know how high to jump to jump over the sound of water? I don't know. It must be instinctive. Uh -huh. um, now, Cliff Blydner is wandering around Long Island uh, doing readings in restaurants and bars and bookstores, and he's wowing people everywhere he goes. And what I want to ask you, Cliff, is do you find that your scientific background uh, is a uh, is a major advantage in the writing of poetry, or do you ever do you ever wish that you were the bohemian type lying around uh, fooling with substances and uh, having all sorts of visions? No, I I'm happy where I am and who I am, and I, and I I believe that poetry is composed of knowledge, inspiration, and creativity, like a three-point triangle, and the knowledge that I bring to it, I say, translate scientific concepts into into poetic forms mm -hmm. and looking for rich old potential spouses who uh, it's a thought, it's a thought. We'll, be, we'll be flashing okay. we'll be flashing Victoria's <laughs> well, we're not intro land. Yeah, we're not intro land. <laughs> we'll be we'll be flashing Victoria's 800 number on yeah, okay. so have your have your pen and paper ready in the meantime Cliff would you uh, would you dazzle us with a little more science here okay uh, <clears throat> This is, uh, this is called uh, Eternal Witch Hunt. The Earth glides quietly through space and its revolving ballet of celestial grace. Down on that sphere is man, still trying to be best. Down on that sphere is man, decadent and possessed. Some have walked erect, project from the witch doctor's cave. Others have slumbered unmolested to their grave. They are the ones the ones who try to enslave the free. They are the majority. They exile Dante, Machiavelli, and Da Vinci. They threaten to burn Galileo. They burn Bruno and Joan of Arc. They shot Gandhi, Kennedy, and King, and they fired Al Dark. They guillotined Lavoyer, and they electrocuted Sacco and Van Zetti. A thousand crosses after Christ the perpetual loser of eternal trice, the creative mind. The victory, the legacy left behind. And I think we're going to have to be really careful. Do um, you see any witches under there? No, no. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that the creative person is, has, had, has a tough life to live in a scientific and technological society. Being in both worlds, I can relate to both. Well, I guess we're safe for the moment. Um, be, that brings me to another point. You have a tendency every so often to run a writer's group or teach a workshop here and there, uh, especially on, on your pet forms. But um, what I want to ask you is how do you, Cliff, uh, bring out the creative spirit in students who might be intimidated by the way the world occasionally treats the creative soul? Well, the way I see it is that there's poetry everywhere, and I, and and most of most of the workshops today they work on automatic writing. That just sit down and start writing. That if you like, if you want to be a plumber, you have to practice plumbing. That you know, I and I, many writers they they wait for inspiration. Now if my now if my uh, cellar was leaking and the pipes burst. And I say to the plumber, well, why don't you fix it? And he says, I'm waiting for inspiration. It doesn't go. So what we say is that, <laughs> that a, if you're a writer, write. And, uh, and it depends on what you're after. If you, in order to write a novel, uh, Carolyn Forche says, go to the same place at the same time and spend two hours a day there. And, and we do a half hour a day for poetry. Uh, with any luck at all, you'll be writing during that time period. Right. Uh, either that or you just sit there and do nothing. And believe me, you'll write rather than do nothing. But, uh, and, and there are techniques of clustering, uh, like one word, mm. and you cluster around that word, whatever it may be. When I was five years old, um, we were living in this apartment, and the pipes burst. And the plumber came. And he said exactly, and we said exactly what you described, or at least my parents did. Why don't you fix the pipes? 
And the plumber looked at us and said, please, I'm writing a poem. <laughs> and even in those days, he was getting over $20 an hour, and that's when I knew I wanted to be a poet. And you know what? I'm still waiting for my $20 an hour. <laughs> anyway, well, uh, while we're waiting, how about some more poems? Well, I can identify with the story that you told it. That I wanted to be a poet when I saw when uh, this woman I liked mm -hmm. liked the movie Doctor Zhivago, oh. and he was a doctor and a poet, and he had a wife and a mistress. And I said, "Boy, what a si great situation!" Ah, so. Under one roof, <laughs> the office, the wife, yeah. and the mistress. A right. poem, please. A poem. <laughs> oh, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, I'm going to read some more uh, some more haiku. Okay. I should have killed that large crawling ant because next I found it in my cup. I should have killed that large crawling ant because next I found it in my cup. And that really happened. I mean, ah. that's what I'm saying, that there's poetry everywhere. Mm -hmm. A little something for the Soviet Union falling. Bird droppings dropping on the commissar. Bird droppings dropping on the commissar. Gee, I'm glad we're indoors. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, keep going. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Standing still and quiet in the swarming bees, the samurai warrior. Widespread the seagull's wingspan over wind, over waves. Ah, you stop repeating. What is the significance yeah. of repeating a haiku? You sound like a very spiritual bingo caller at times when you're... Right. Well, the significance is because uh, you can miss it. Uh, miss what? Miss the oh, haiku. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, if it's because... Uh, I, it goes so fast because we're not we're not used to we're not used to this kind of poetry in the West. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I just stopped repeating because ah. I because after a while you can get people focused and quiet enough to really listen in. Are you focused? And that's the, yes, very. That's oh. the whole that's the whole rationale. Is the crew focused? Uh -huh. And <laughs> how about the camera? And uh, <laughs> like you say that like you say with spirit. <laughs> Haiku is a, is a Zen moment of enlightenment. It's a spiritual moment. Okay, let's have a few quick uh, more moments of enlightenment. After the battle, coming out of the rubble, a beetle. After the battle, coming out of the rubble, a beetle. Was he in that bottle you were talking about earlier? Guess so. Ah. And another Sanryu that you reminded me of. Mm -hmm. uh, on first reading, I missed the haiku, uh, and then I missed it again. Uh -huh. Another one, beneath the subway grating, one large weed grows. And sometimes it concretizes. Beneath the subway grating, one large weed grows, that it's in the shape of a weed below the grating. I've run into many weeds on the subway, right. I must say. And the other, and the one I said earlier, widespread the seagull's wingspan over wind, over waves. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's, I have the flying saucer theory of haiku that, yeah. that it's just one unit hang, hanging there. Get three lines that hang together. Oh, look, there goes one now. Uh, and on that <laughs> we're note, indoors, on, on that <laughs> note, we're going to thank Cliff Blyder, the scientific poet. For, I think it was a paper plane. For, <laughs> it could have been, a little scientific inspiration. And we're going to thank uh, Victoria Crosby for coming on and uh, doing her charming material. Um, thank goodness I'm not available. <laughs> and uh, we're thanking Glenn and the School Street Deli for letting us film this. And I'm going to give you one quick drop dead. Dramatic dilemma. If an actor falls in a forest doing the death scene of his life and no one applauds or even hears, does that count as an unsold pilot? And so, until next time, this is Robert Dunn for Poet the Poet saying, Cognito, ergo, sum.